During contentious testimony before the House Oversight Committee, Hunter Biden's former business partner, Tony Bobulinski, was grilled by AOC on the specific crime that he alleges President Joe Biden committed. And Ms. Ocasio-Cortez did not like his response. Did you watch him steal something? Cor- corruption statutes, you, RICO and conspiracy. What is it? What is, Sarah, what is the crime, sir? You, you, Specifically. You, just, uh, wait, you, keep, uh, you asked me to answer the question. I answered the question. No. RICO, you're obviously not familiar with. Corruption Excuse statutes. Excuse me, sir. Excuse Sarah. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. RICO is not a crime. It is a category. What I is the, it's the category crime? of crimes that you're then charged? <laughs> you under have charges. A long hundred. You have charges, statutes. sir. Yeah. Please you want me to name, name the exact statute sir? under RICO. Yes. Oh, well, it's funny in this committee room. Everyone's not here. There's over eight. All right, sir. I reclaim my lawyers. Time. That- Just for a little fact check, RICO is very much a crime. <laughs> it is. It's a group of crimes, and they are the crimes that took down the mob. Ironically. RICO is the crime that the Democrats are alleging Trump committed. The whole Georgia prosecution of Donald Trump is predicated upon the belief that RICO is a crime. Corruption, conspiracy, failure to register as a foreign agent, those are also all crimes for the record. The whole exchange reminded me of another classic legal exchange. I know a lot about the law and various other lawyerings. Um, I'm well-educated, well-versed. I know that situations like this, real estate-wise, they're very complex. Actually, they're pretty simple. The forms are all standard boilerplate. Okay, well, we're all hungry. We're gonna get to our hot plate soon enough. I forgot, where did you go to law school again? Uh, well, I could ask you that very same I question. I went to Harvard. Huh? Mm-hmm. How about you? Where? Yeah. I'm pleading the fifth, sir. Uh-huh. I'd advise that you do that. And I'll take that advice into cooperation, all right? <sighs> Now, let's say you and I go toe-to-toe on bird law and see who comes out the victor. You know, I don't think I'm going to do anything um, close to that. The always sunny clip is funny, you see, because Charlie is a janitor who doesn't actually know anything about the law. The congressional clip is less funny because AOC is a legislator who somehow appears to know even less about the law. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. Italian Prime Minister Georgia Maloney is suing a guy for making fake porn of her. She's suing him for 100,000 euro. We will get to that and what it means for the political order in just a moment. First, though, you got to get your smells and bells candle over here at The Daily Wire. Dailywire.com slash shop. The Daily Wire obviously is going to stop selling these after Easter. This is a Lenten-themed candle that will make your home smell like a 12th century monastery. I love it. I think it's our best-selling candle ever by a long shot, even better selling than the uh, the very famous, um, whew, look at that, just explodes, uh, even, even more famous than the pumpkin spice candle, which you can get today. We've got a nice wood wick, some nice little beautiful smells. Uh, so we've sold a bazillion of them. We still have some left to sell head on over to dailywire.com slash shop before they are gone. Speaking of strange legal developments, an appeals court has just stopped a Texas immigration law from going into effect because the Supreme Court allowed the Texas immigration law to go into effect because a lower court had stopped the immigration law from going into effect. So where are we? We're at this very strange place where the appeals court can overrule the Supreme Court. How does that work? Uh, I I know a little bit more about the law than either AOC or Charlie Kelly, uh, but not all that much more. Uh, see if you can follow this. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals blocked the Texas immigration law, saying that Texas can enforce its own borders. The Supreme Court lifted a a hold blocking that law, arguing that it it needed to be ruled on by the lower Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals first. Then, almost immediately afterward, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals again blocked the measure, which is called Senate Bill 4, 
from being put into effect, but without any explanation. So they didn't exactly rule on it or they, they didn't provide any rationale for it. They just said, we're going to block it. And then the court will hear further arguments on Wednesday. Do you know what all of this is about? Even if you don't know anything about the law, the upshot of all of this is we never get to object to mass migration. That's it, period. We don't, there will always be something preventing us from in any way restricting mass migration. We can elect Democrats. We can elect Republicans. We can pass laws. We can get court rulings. It doesn't matter. The mass migration will continue, period. This is true in America. This is true in most of Europe. There is, as far as I can tell, pretty much one country in Europe that has stopped mass migration, that is Hungary. And the liberal establishment in the West has done everything it can to make the leader of Hungary who did that, Viktor Orban, a pariah, to, to totally uh, ostracize him from the, the leadership of the West. They haven't been successful. He's too strong, and Hungary is just too solid a country to put up with it. But otherwise, you don't get to object to mass migration, period. Why is that? Because the political order, the liberal order right now, depends upon mass migration. And that's that. We, we have dying populations, uh, and 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 declining populations, even well below the, the point of replacement, other than in Hungary, which has started to turn the population around. It's still a dying population, though. Uh, so if the economies aren't going to falter, you need to just import mass labor. And uh, the, the liberals like the mass migration because it gives them an electoral advantage. The businesses like mass migration, it gives them a, a major labor pool to exploit. It's just beneficial to so many powers that if, if the pesky little people want to stop it, that's, that's just not good enough. That's it. That's how you explain it. If you want that to change, as I certainly would like that to change, as most people throughout the West want that to change, is the number one campaign issue, according to many surveys, and it has been for a number of years, if you want that to change, you've got to get a little bit more creative and start putting pressure on the different interest groups that are pushing for mass migration. Speaking of illegal aliens... An illegal alien on the terror watch list was just arrested after shooting up a business and attacking cops. So this, this is an illegal alien, not from Honduras, not from Guatemala, not from Nicaragua, from uh, the Middle East, was arrested last week in North Carolina after opening fire at a business and then attacking cops who were trying to arrest him. So when, when the cops finally arrest him, U.S. immigration and Customs Enforcement reaches out, ICE, they, they tell the Gates County Sheriff's Office that actually this guy that they just arrested who shot up the business, he's on the terrorist screening data set. That's, that's commonly known as the terror watch list, which raises a question. What is the point of the terror watch list? What's the point? We have a terror watch list that's to watch out for these guys. Uh, then they sneak into the country. They've been in the country for a while. They shoot up a business they harm people, they attack cops, and then we say, hey, that guy, by the way, we knew he was a terrorist. Oh, well, why didn't you do something to stop him? And there, there is an answer to that. I'm not, I'm not leaving the question dangling. The, the, the reason for that is that we have a totally open border and people come into our country all the time, totally unvetted. By design, Joe Biden insists on that. He wants to vastly increase the number of foreign nationals from all over the place, from Latin America, from the Middle East, from Africa, from Asia, to just come in unvetted. So given that, what is the point of the terror watch list? If we can't actually know anything about these people, if we can't track their movements, if we, we're not even allowed to arrest people when they break the, some of the most fundamental laws of the country, what's the, get rid of it. There's just no reason to have it. What, so that, so that after every major crime, we can hear, oh, actually, so-and-so was known to law enforcement. Oh, they were known. Now about law enforcement does something about it. Oh, well, the political powers won't let law enforcement do anything about it. Okay, so, so what? So what? So we can't do anything. We, at, at a deeper level, even beyond the immigration question, we are not allowed to pass our own laws on, on, when it comes to the issues that really matter to the Democrats, we're not allowed to pass our own laws if those laws contradict them. We're not allowed to have our court rulings. Some limited cases, maybe, but no, if it, if it starts to threaten things like immigration, no, you can't. Yeah, the Supreme Court ruled too bad. We're going yeah, to overrule that. We're not allowed to have our own law enforcement officers and mechanisms. 
Guys on the list, get them out of the country. No, you're not allowed to get those guys out of the country. Maybe once they shoot up a neighborhood or a shop, then the law enforcement can say, oh yeah, we could have told you so. Yeah, you could have, but you didn't. We are, we often hear in Washington, D.C. that the, the gears of government are grinding to a halt. You know, there's too much friction. Nothing gets done. On the one hand, I'm perfectly happy if the members of Congress aren't able to pass that many laws because a lot of what they do is really dumb and, and uh, contrary to the flourishing of the country. But just the basic mechanics of having a society run those are also grinding to a halt. It's not just the new legal innovations of these uh, members of Congress who are passing a bunch of dumb laws. I'm talking like the really basic stuff, like you arrest the criminals, you have a border, that stuff, that is also grinding to a halt. How long can a country continue to operate? Certainly a global hegemon continue to operate if that is the case. When there's turmoil such as this, might be good to protect some of your wealth with gold. That's why you got to check out Birch Gold. Text Knowles to 989898. Despite the anticipated rate cuts by financial experts, inflation continues to rise. The U.S. is grappling with a staggering debt of $34 trillion, and yet we continue to print more money, driving up the prices of everyday essentials even further. You can bury your head in the sand or do something about it. Consider diversifying at least some of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. As a leading dealer of precious metals in the United States, Birch Gold is committed to helping you discover how gold, silver, and other precious metals can help protect your lifestyle in the face of current and coming economic instabilities. Birch Gold makes it easy to own gold. They will help you convert your existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and you won't pay a penny out of pocket. I really like gold. I have a fairly strong position in gold when it comes to my portfolio. And you ought to consider making gold part of your saving strategy with Birch Gold. They have been the exclusive gold partner of The Daily Wire for over seven years, helping thousands of our listeners, and they can help you too. Text Knowles, Canada WLAS, to 989898. Get your free info kit on gold. Then talk to a precious metal specialist about protecting your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Knowles, Canada WLAS, to 989898 now. Speaking of not knowing things, <laughs> not knowing who's here, how we get here, how we run the government. Speaking of not knowing things, there's a new study out which shows that something we thought we knew about science is not true. Maybe not true. Apparently, there's no dark matter, according to this study. You ever hear of dark matter? You might have learned about this in science class or read about it in pop science articles. You know, we got matter, you know, regular matter that we kind of hand, like my microphone or my leftist ears tumbler. But then we're told much of the universe is made up of something called dark matter. And what is dark matter? Well, we never really knew what it is. But now, according to this new study that just came out of the University of Ottawa, there is no such thing as dark matter. We, we, don't, we don't really know anything. Shocking study upends decades of consensus about the universe's composition. Dark matter is a term used in cosmology to describe a type of matter that does not interact with light or the electromagnetic field, hence that it is uh, dark. Uh, uh, scientists long believed that dark matter makes up something like 25% of the universe with ordinary matter constituting less than 5%. So most of the matter is supposedly dark matter. And then the rest is dark energy, whatever that is. And this is supposed to explain how galaxies and stars and planets work. But then we find out that uh, that's probably not real. So why do I mention this? Do I believe this study more than I believe the other studies? Uh, no, not really. I'm kind of skeptical of all scientific studies. Uh, but that's not why. Maybe it's true that there's no such thing as dark matter. Maybe there is dark matter. Maybe it's 25% of the universe. Maybe it's 30%. I don't know what percentage it is. I mentioned the story to point out that we don't really know much of anything about science. The, the common view, the common sense view in liberal modernity is that we know a lot about science, but we don't know a lot about philosophy and theology. Meaning we know a lot about physics stuff, but we don't really know anything about metaphysics, you know, ethics and 
God and the soul and morality. With that, we can't, we don't know anything about that. We can't really know anything. A lot of that's up to just kind of your subjective point of view, man. And you do you, and we can never know anything about right blood. You hear that a lot. And but they say, but science is firm. It's verifiable. It's replicable. In this house, we believe in science. That's what the, all the liberal lawn signs say. The funny thing is, though, the irony is, it's exactly the opposite. Totally reversed. We know basically nothing about science, that is, the, the physical world, uh, like stuff. We know, we know basically nothing about that and how the universe works. And we do know a considerable amount about metaphysics, about morality, about the soul, about uh, the, the relation of the creation to its creator. We actually can know more about that. Why? Not just because a very wonderful old book, the Bible, tells us about it. That's sometimes what the science people accuse. They say, you're just Bible thumping. No, I'm not the reason that we know more about metaphysics than we know about physics is because physics requires really powerful microscopes and really powerful telescopes and the measurements of all sorts of things that we can really have no access to at all. Whereas metaphysics is actually a little closer to us. We can deduce con uh, conclusions about the metaphysical world using things like logic, uh, using things like our reason, using things like our moral conscience. And then revelation helps that as well. And there's also strong evidence for revelation, but even just through reason. We, uh, some, for some reason, the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about the natural law on this show and, and in American politics. The natural law is a lot closer to us than planet Zebulon 7 that we're supposed to learn about with a big telescope. We can know about it just using our own two eyes and the two brain cells that we hope, hope we have in our head. Maybe, if, maybe some of us have a few more than them. We can be more certain of those things. In fact, you can never really be certain of the conclusions you reach through empirical experiments because you're beginning with just like stuff and observations, and then you're extrapolating from those, those observations about the physical world to come to general principles. When we're talking about uh, metaphysics, when we're talking about certain aspects of philosophy and theology, you, are, you, you actually can be certain because you're, you're using logic. You're, you, don't, you don't have to replicate experiments under a microscope. It's, uh, it's, it's much more given to universal conclusions. We, we get totally confused about that, though. And it's, it's why, as our civilization, on the one hand, seems to be so much more advanced. You know, we have these magical little black screen portals to hell in our pocket, you know, where I can call someone on the other side of the world. We've got fast cars. We've got airplanes. We've got all—it seems like we're really progressing. And yet, then, the, on the flip side, we no longer know what a man and what a woman is, right? We, on the flip side of that— we can no longer make an argument as to why it's wrong to commit murder. We no longer know the purpose of government. We no longer know what a legislature is or a judiciary system. How is that possible? It's because of this lie that we've told ourselves in modernity. We know so much about science. Yeah, well, the science changes every single day. The one thing I know about science for certain is that whatever we think about science today will, will be considered extremely stupid about 50 years from now, if we're lucky, probably 10 years from now. And yet the enduring truths that we know about philosophy and theology, those have been pretty stable, actually. <laughs> those haven't, anthropology, the human nature, those things haven't really changed. Those eternal principles are, are pretty reliable. Now, speaking of science experiments and human nature, there's a really gross and disturbing story out, which uh, is perhaps worth checking out. Uh, Nearly 171,000 American women used sperm from a sperm bank to get pregnant in 1995. That, that number is higher than I would have expected. But then fast forward 21 years. By 2016, the number had risen to more than 440,000. More U.S. women are waiting longer to get married. They're waiting longer to have a child. 
They're not getting married, but they still want to have a child. So then they go to the sperm store and they buy half a child from, uh, from s- some creepy guy who made, you know, a few hundred dollars anonymously. And then they create a baby with the express purpose of denying that baby his father. There's a woman who just just wrote a, a pretty good essay about this. And it's, it's worth reading because it it gives you a really honest glimpse into a really perverse phenomenon. But this was her ad. This was the ad she put out because she she first looked up the sperm stores and she said, it seems too clinical. You know, I don't want to just have a, one paragraph about the father of my child. I don't want to just hear a little audio clip of him. I want to really, I want to know him a little bit. I want to at least meet him once. So she puts this ad out. She, she Googles sperm donor that you know finds a website, and she says, seeking a donor in or near the Washington, D.C. metro area. Artificial insemination only. (laughs) That probably weeds out a fair number of particular creeps on those websites. Uh, We'll consider working with folks willing to travel. Here's the rub. I'm looking for someone who's willing to be in the kid's life from birth. Not every day, or even every week or month. Not a co-parent, once known as a father, uh, but someone who can answer questions for the kid and provide a healthy explanation about why you chose to help their mom bring them into the world. I'd love to make a new lifelong friend who shares my values and wants to stay in touch, get updates on the kiddo, and attend the occasional birthday party. We used to call that a husband, by the way. Now we call it a lifelong friend. I'm hoping to find someone reliable and kind. So why? Why is she going this this kind of bizarre facocta route when she could just like find a guy? Says, always wanted to be a mom. I've just found success in my career as a journalist that has never matched in my personal life. It is my dream to become a parent, please help me make that happen. This is all really, really sad, really, really disordered and harmful, and really, really predictable. We'll get to that in one second. First, though, speaking of life and death, you ought to check out Policy Genius. Go to policygenius.com slash Knowles. No one likes to talk about life insurance because that reminds you that you're going to die, but you are going to die, so that's that, and you got to talk about it. It's extremely important to have a good life insurance policy to protect your family when something happens to you. Start shopping now with Policy Genius. Find the right policy to protect your family today. Give yourself the peace of mind that comes with knowing that if something were to happen to you, your family could cover all their expenses while getting back on their feet. Policy Genius's technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. You already have a life insurance policy through work. That might not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it may not follow if you leave your job. You need a backup plan. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval, they avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. When they make it this easy, there's no reason not to do it. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over the other. You can trust their guidance. Save time and money right now, policygenius.com slash Knowles, or click the link in the description. Get those quotes right now, policygenius.com slash Knowles. Modernity is just a giant Rube Goldberg machine. Talking about the idolatry of science, you know the Rube Goldberg machines where it's there are 700 crazy steps to accomplish a really simple task that you could have done in one or two steps? That's modernity for you. In the old days, when we were all just stupid and illiterate, you know, we weren't sciencey and we didn't even have iPods and stuff. Back in those days, a man and a woman would just find each other and they would get married and they would do this thing and they'd have kids and they'd have a family and they'd have a good life. Today, though, we're really smart and fancy and sophisticated. So desperate, miserable women need to wait until their late 30s to put an advertisement out begging a man to commit a mortal sin into a cup or something and then uh, purchase that so that they can produce a child that might know his father or probably won't know his father so that the so that the mother can fulfill her desire to have a child as a sort of appendage or a handbag kind of like a little poodle uh, everything about this so terribly perverse i i wondered if i were a woman if i were in this woman's shoes because i think she she makes a really honest point here when she says look I've been really successful in my career, but I've 
Now I woke up one day and I realized I don't have the things that really matter. I think that's true for a lot of women. And I think in part that's because they've been lied to from the moment they were born. And, and in this age that is so influenced by feminism, they're told, you don't need a man. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. You need to be strong and independent. You, you don't relate to sex any differently than men do. You need to go out and hook up with a lot of people and you need to go to college and get a degree so you can get a job in the widget factory. And, but more likely, if you're a lady, you'll probably be in marketing or PR or journalism or something. This woman's a journalist. And uh, then you got to go to the city and live on your own or with a roommate. And you need to hook up with a lot of people and go to brunch every Sunday and just work, 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 work. And don't do anything that will be uh, edifying and grow your your family or your personal life. And then maybe freeze your eggs. And then one day you're going to find out that uh, you're getting a little too late to get married. So then you need to purchase some guy's sperm. And then maybe you can have a kid to fulfill your own desires rather than uh, having a kid as a product of your natural love for your husband with whom you are in a lifelong union that exists for the very purpose of the generation and education of those children. Both of you in on that and for the mutual support of the spouses, the latter part of which you will be deprived if you do this because we live in liberal modernity. They've been lied to. And so they get to that point and they freak out and they say, I need a kid. It's getting too late. That biological clock starts ticking. And they have a kid in the, in the wrong way, in a way that is not conducive to the good of the child and not conducive to the good of the woman either, because she's, she's going to have to raise a kid on, on her own, and it's very difficult. Even the way she writes, she goes, yeah, look, I'm looking for someone willing to be in the kid's life from birth, but not every day. Or even, I don't want to see you every day. I don't want to see my child's father every day or week or month. Just like, you know, every now and again, so that I can make myself feel better about intentionally depriving a kid of his father. You can just like write the kid a letter. That's not good enough for the kid. That maybe that's good enough for you, liberal journalist lady. That's not good enough for the kid. A kid needs mommy and daddy, full stop. And it's one thing to say we live in a fallen world. Maybe daddy runs off. He goes to get a pack of cigarettes. He doesn't come back. It's a fallen world. You know, maybe a parent dies. And yeah, they're all, we, we get by and we, and we do the best we can in an imperfect world. But to intentionally deprive a kid of that, because you just, didn't get your life together to get married, but you still want a kid and too bad for the, too bad for, you know, the little kiddo if he doesn't get his daddy. It's all right. He'll write him a birthday card every so often, occasionally. That's very wrong and very, very selfish. I was thinking, I started this thought and then I trailed off. If I were a woman and I were in this woman's, what would I do? I'd probably go to a bar I mean, ideally what you do is you just get married and you do all the right virtuous things. But if I, if I were in this woman's exact circumstances and I had the same views and behaviors as this woman, I'd probably just like go to a bar and find a guy and go back to my apartment and then boom, you get a kid. And who knows, maybe the two you get married and maybe you actually have a good life. To quote John Lennon, many children have been born out of a, a, a bottle of whiskey. Maybe that's what you do. If you're gonna do this already, why not do it the natural way? Why do you get all these the doctors involved or the black market sperm donors and the websites? And why do you make it so freaking clinical? For goodness sakes, you know, Cole Porter sings, let's do it. Let's go on a website and purchase sperm. And then you maybe get the guy to write a birthday card to his son every few years. No, it's let's do it. Let's fall in love. It's not that complicated. It's not that complicated. Modernity makes it complicated. Liberalism makes it complicated. Hyper-individualism that tells you to ignore everyone else and just pursue your own interests. That kind of liberalism on the left and on the right. That kind of liberalism among the hippies and the free lovers and that kind of liberalism among Ayn Rand and the, the virtue of selfishness. All of that is what makes this so complicated. Doesn't have to be. You know, you kind of know just naturally. We're social creatures. We're coupling creatures. Men like women, women like men. Sometimes we like each other so much that that, that love becomes another person. We know it's best for the kid if the parents both raise him together, married forever for life. Just do it. Just do it. We're not so much smarter than every generation that came before us. We don't even know what dark matter is, okay? <laughs> we don't. We don't, we're not just, if you kind of follow the just prejudices of every generation before us, you're probably going to live a better life than if you try to reinvent everything from scratch. Speaking of weird sex stuff, 
Giorgia Maloney, who's the prime minister of Italy, is suing a guy for creating deep fake porn about her. Georgia Maloney is a lady, and she's a nice looking lady. And uh, for nice looking ladies in the public eye, there is a problem that is rapidly increasing, which is that uh, computer tools make it easy to make fake porn of the women. This has been true for years, decades perhaps even. You know, with Photoshop, you can kind of make it look like Georgia Maloney is naked. That's one thing. But now with the rise of artificial intelligence, you can make elaborate, very convincing pictures, elaborate, very convincing videos. This kind of a scandal just hit Taylor Swift. Remember a few weeks ago or maybe a month or two ago when Taylor Swift was uh, through AI, you know, seen to be doing all these horrific things in a football stadium. It was really, really gross. I didn't watch it, by the way. I hope you didn't watch it either. But uh, she she considered taking legal action. And George Maloney is taking legal action. She is suing the guy, the two men who did this uh, for 100,000 euro. This is a defamation lawsuit. Uh, but there are, there are other ways to go after after them too. One, an unlicensed commercial use of their image. These videos have been viewed millions of times. They were shared on a U.S. porn site, and they've been viewed millions of times. That has generated a lot of revenue. This was done by a 40-year-old man and his 73-year-old father, allegedly. They're under investigation now. It's, It's unclear exactly who or if maybe both of them did it, but it's so freaking creepy. And the only way this is going to stop is through lawfare in the short run. And then once you you, uh, reimpose legal restrictions on this, then perhaps you can uh, beef up the cultural restrictions on it as well. The the taboo, the the shame that would go along with being caught doing something. So could you imagine you're one of these guys? First of all, it's not even like it's a 16-year-old kid. 16-year-old kid uh, who's not in control of his his hormones and his lusts, you know, goofing around on Photoshop. That's that's one thing, I guess. A 40-year-old man and his 73-year-old father that is so disgusting, that is so <laughs> deeply shameful. And, and she sues. All of these women should sue because we're, we're in the early stages of this technology. So we're going to see what kind of uh, legal restrictions we're going to put on them. In the early days of the internet, the conservatives and the liberals came together in America, tried to put restrictions on internet porn, and liberal judges overruled it. We missed our chance on the Communications Decency Act and the Child Online Protection Act. Had those two laws passed and imposed all sorts of restrictions on porn, a generation of kids who write into this show a lot uh, would, would have been much, much better off. Now, finally, 20 years later, more than 20 years later, you're beginning to see some of those restrictions put back on with the age verification laws, for instance, that are being passed for porn sites in a lot of different states. Well, this is the next step of that. We're now, in, we're, we're now in what the 90s were to the internet. That is today for artificial intelligence. And it's not going to stop with Georgia Maloney. It's not going to stop with Taylor Swift. The creepiest part is it's going to be the girl in your math class. That, that is already happening. There are already cases about this. Prosecute it as hard as you can now, under all the existing laws, then pass some new laws. Otherwise, this is going to spin out of control and no woman in the world is going to be safe from what is a, a, a type of digital rape. Now, speaking of legal maneuvers and speaking of people taking things that don't belong to them, uh, President Trump is in a pickle because the Attorney General of New York, Letitia James, is demanding almost half a billion dollars from him in some bogus civil fraud judgment. Now, neither Trump nor anyone on earth can come up with half a billion dollars overnight. And just even Elon Musk couldn't really do that, as I mentioned yesterday on the show. So he's not going to be able to scrap together the money. That leaves him with two options. He could either file Chapter 11. He could could declare bankruptcy. He's done that before, and he was able to bounce back from that. Uh, That might protect his properties, but it carries some risks. If you're running for president, do you really want to declare bankruptcy halfway through your campaign? That's probably kind of a PR loss. Who knows if it would work this time? Uh, So then the other option is let the attorney general, let the liberals take his property. And not only would that strategy serve to make him look like a martyr, serve to make him look like he's being unjustly persecuted, which the vast majority of Americans believe he is, including Democrats. 
But it would also give him the opportunity to get his properties back. Because if this extremely brazen partisan hack attorney general in New York who ran on destroying Trump, if she takes his property, she takes Trump Tower, she takes his property down by Wall Street. If she takes that, Trump's going to appeal it. It could go up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court could say, no, we don't actually get to um, steal all the possessions of vanquished political leaders. That's not, that's something they do in banana republics. It's something they did in ancient Rome. We don't do that here. That's not how we run our, our, our system. Trump could then get his property back. No harm, no foul. And maybe he gets elected president in the meantime. The risk to that is that if Trump lets her take the property, She could go out and sell it. All that Trump would be entitled to on appeal would be the money, half half a billion dollars or whatever. But he could lose the property. Now, would the property sell fast enough for that to happen? Probably. That would be the gamble for Trump to take. But if you're looking at the three options here, uh, one, come up with the cash. That's practically impossible, as his lawyers have argued. Two, declare bankruptcy would probably probably destroy his presidential campaign and might not even work legally or three let her let them take the property and then and then very possibly or even likely get that property back on appeal that looks to be the smart strategy and it's the most dramatic and president trump has a flair for the dramatic so probably that's the strategy that he'll go with ladies and gentlemen i want you to behold the iconic leftist years tumbler It's back, sending shivers down the spines, thrills up the legs of the woke baristas everywhere. But wait, there's a twist. It's yours for free when you become a Daily Wire Plus annual member. Now, I know what you're thinking. Membership? I hardly know her ship. No, that's not what you're thinking. You're saying membership? I just want the legendary leftist tears tumbler. Sure, unlimited access to ad-free, uncensored shows from the Daily Wire hosts you love is great. Having hit stories and movies and series and groundbreaking documentaries on demand is fabulous. But... What you've really been waiting for is the Leftist Years Tumblr, and now it's yours for free with an insider annual membership. You want more? New all-access members get two Leftist Years Tumblrs for free. That's right. Double the cred. Double the liberal meltdowns. Become an annual member today, dailywire.com, dailywireplus.com, for your iconic Leftist Years Tumblr, and drink to triggering the left. Chin, chin. My favorite comment yesterday is from Slap My Bass. 3825, who says, now that the bar exam is banned in Washington state, it is safe to assume that any random citizen from a red state is smarter than the average lawyer in Seattle. <laughs> well, it depends. It's all, it depends how many lawyers opt not to take the bar exam. The ones who take the bar exam, are they're going to be the only reliable lawyers, certainly. So it depends. Is it going to be truly barbarians at the gates just like it opens up and, and now the most lawyers in Seattle are dummies who are totally uneducated, don't know anything about the law. I, if that's the case, they shouldn't try to become practicing lawyers in Washington. They should try to become legislators in Washington, <laughs> D.C., not the state, but the district. Then they'll be much more successful. You don't need to know a damn thing about the law to become a legislator in D.C. Uh, so it could be that case, or the practical effect might be all the good law firms hire the the lawyers who can pass the bar exam. And then you get a bunch of joker lawyers trying to hang a shingle. And 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 that means that the rich people get the good lawyers and the bad people and the, the not the bad people, the poor people get the bad lawyers, which is, I guess, basically what we've we've always had. It'll just be greatly exacerbated. And in the name of equity, you will have a complete stratification of the kind of legal counsel that people are entitled to. Now, Speaking of President Trump, you remember about a week ago, President Trump said that uh, he's going he's gonna to support car manufacturing in America, and he's going to, if he's elected, uh, prevent China from stealing American car manufacturing, and he's going to place major tariffs on that, and it's going to rebuild American, American manufacturing. And if he's not elected, it's going to be a bloodbath. The libs then ran with that and said, he's a fascist. He's, a, he's going to kill us all. He's going he's to genocide all of us. He's Hitler times 100. Uh, obviously, President Trump was, was speaking figuratively there. But uh, I got to give a hat tip over to Breitbart and John Binder over there, who points out that if you just look up the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of bloodbath, 
uh, not not the primary definition, but uh, a secondary or tertiary definition is uh, major economic turmoil, specifically an economic crisis. Uh, so even we could use it colloquially to mean that, but just even according to the popular dictionary, that is what that means. Not that it will matter for the libs because the libs, as you know, love to change the meaning of words all the time. I would not be surprised if Merriam-Webster Merriam Dictionary erased that definition of the word. I, I happen to write a book on this called Speechless Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, which is available now. There you go. Thank you. That You could tell the producers knew that that plug was coming. Uh, that's what they do because the, the libs understand that the, the words that we use are not neutral uh, neutral media for communicating ideas, but that they're loaded, they're colored, they, they shape the, the way that you perceive everything. So they have to change the definitions of these words. They need to control the definitions of these words in order to win political debates before they even actually take place. They, they win them through a sort of inception. They just plant their own victories in your head so that you, you, you end up speechless, so that you, you cannot actually, excuse me, excuse me, where's the, do we have a bell there? Okay, I guess the producers fell asleep. There we go. Uh, you wind up speechless because you, you are no longer able, to, thank you, to even conceive of your own side of the argument. Now, Speaking of President Trump's supposed ambitions, the latest controversy that came out yesterday, the latest proof that Donald Trump is an autocrat, a dictator in waiting, is that President Trump said he likes the idea of the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. There it is. That was the clip. That was the clip going around all of the internet. Now, context is important here. President Trump is speaking to Nigel Farage on GB News. It stands for Great Britain News. <laughs> and, and President Trump is very good at relating to people. And so uh, when, when he's speaking to a Brit, he's going to talk about things that might appeal to a Brit. When he's speaking to Kim Jong-un of North Korea, he might speak about things that appeal to Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Uh, he tailors his conversation in that way as, as all persuasive people do, but but I, I suspect what President Trump is saying is just true broadly here. He likes the idea of a royal family. I like the idea of a royal family too. I bet most, not all of you, but most of you listening will like the idea of a royal family because most people always and everywhere like the idea of a royal family because that is embedded into politics. Politics is an extension of the family. The basic political unit, as we say very often on the right, the basic political unit is the family. And then you have the extended family. And then you have the tribe, <laughs> the community. Then you have the tribe. Then you have the state. Then you have the nation. And it kind of builds out from there. But it's, it's all just a, a broadening out of the family. Patriotism is an extension of filial piety, the, the respect and reverence that you owe to your parents. And in nations that have a royal family, uh, even a nation like Britain, which is sort of a monarchy, but it's obviously also a democracy, and it's just, as, as our nation was initially intended to be, it's going to have a monarchical element in the executive, and then it's going to have a democratic element in the legislature, and it's going to have an aristocratic representation. It's going to have a, a, a logical aspect, which is supposed to be the judiciary. It's got all of these things, just as St. Thomas Aquinas writes in the Summa Theologiae. A, a, a perfect government is going to touch on all of these desires and longings and needs from within human nature. A royal family is important because it represents, it symbolizes that bedrock aspect of politics. And it's a unifying uh, entity. That this is why the royal family in Great Britain takes great pains and always has not to become party political, not to become partisan. They're supposed to be above that, a symbol of unity. And, uh, you know, in our hyper-democratic egalitarian age, you'll hear people say, 
all sorts of terrible things about the royal family. That's ridiculous. They wear their tiaras. They live in their palaces. This is awful. It's contrary to the will of the people. Tear them down. Eat them. Take all their stuff. This is very contrary to the well-being of the, the actual people in these countries. The monarchy exists for the good of the people. It's not that the people exist for the good of the monarchy. The people get a lot more out of the, the royal family in Great Britain than the royal family gets out of the people. This is always an argument that, that crops up, but why is it throughout history that uh, men are drawn toward this sort of thing, toward a, uh, some nobility, toward a, a monarch even? Because the, the people want something that they can all hold in common, that, that unites them, that, that dignifies them, that expresses their own dignity and desire for dignity. When you look in the, the United Kingdom, would, would anyone really want to trade places with a member of the royal family? Maybe some people would. Probably not, though. You, your, your choices of what you can do are greatly restricted. Your choices of where you can live, how you can behave, how you can dress, what you, everything is greatly restricted, and it's all in, it's supposed to be in service of the people. And when the royal families step a little too far out of line, then they get booted out or overthrown and all their stuff is taken away and sometimes their heads are chopped off. E frankly, even when they don't step out of line sometimes, that, that sort of thing happens. Trump says, I kind of like that idea of just a unifying figure. Now, before we go, in this same interview with Nadja Farage, uh, President Trump uh, makes a really great observation about uh, Joe Biden and his behavior. Biden likes going to the beach. You could see that. He's always in a bathing suit. It doesn't look good, but he thinks it does, and some advisor does. He could have gone to the beach if he would have left my policies in order, having to do with the economy, having to do with everything. So true. Preach, President Trump. Joe Biden likes going to the beach. He thinks he looks good in a bathing suit. He does not. And he could have gone to the beach all he wanted and relaxed had he just kept Trump's policies in order. I mention it because... This guy is still funny. This guy has still got it. This guy is still quick on his feet. There is no way the Democrats can let Biden debate him. But they'll say he's an insurrectionist. He's a fascist. We're not going to dignify him with a debate. He's a criminal. He's, he deserves 700 years in prison. He's bankrupt. He's going to say, they're going to say anything they can to get Biden out of the debate because Trump is still pretty fast. He doesn't really seem to have lost a beat. Uh, he, I've, I've said before that he seems to exhibit what the writer Nassim Nicholas Taleb calls anti-fragility. The more you pummel this guy, the tougher he gets, <laughs> it seems. Uh, he's just going to keep pummeling ahead until they take all of his property, until they put him in an orange jumpsuit, until they banish him from St. Helena. This is very much in character with the executive. You know, in a, getting back to what we were saying about the royal family, we live in a very liberal and egalitarian age that, that tries to destroy all distinctions and, and deny even conceptions of dignity and spiritedness. But the, the point of the executive, the point of the presidency, is to be the spirited part of the government, the thumatic part of the government, to use an old, dusty Greek word. The, the legislature is the appetitive part of the government. It's, you know, the, the congressmen get reelected every two years. They're very accountable to the passions of the people. The, the judiciary is supposed to be the purely logical part of the government that just interprets the law and they're in their long robes and they're in their giant, their, their big, beautiful temple. The presidency is the spirited part. And people know that intuitively. They desire that naturally. And between Trump and Biden right now, there is no question. One of them represents a spirited aspect of the United States. And the Democrats are terrified of that. The rest of the show continues now. You do not want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans.